said next, after his teaching on the masterful craft of speck removal and your brother and sister. But I have to say, uh, we had a great discussion uh, Friday night in our family group. If you're visiting with us, we have family groups that meet throughout the city, uh, mostly geographic, where we come together in smaller groups uh, just to meet people, to spend time together, and so that everyone really has an opportunity to talk. Really grateful uh, for our group Friday night. We just had a wonderful time, didn't we? Yep. We really did. We had a great discussion talking about what we learned last Sunday in the first six verses of Matthew 7. And what we did was we looked at some questions, examined our own lives, uh, how we want to treat other people, and how we would want to be treated when we're helping one another with things that we really want to change. And so it was really a, a wonderful time, just spending time, uh, James and Helen and Helen Gardner and uh, my wife, of course, Amy and Jackie, uh, Tina was there, Lee was sick, we missed him, but we were able to get together and just have a wonderful discussion. Now I feel like I can speak to you more honestly, uh, get rid of the hypocrisy there, hopefully. But we had a wonderful time, and, and I do believe what we studied last week, I hope you are watering those seeds of the Word of God, because what we studied last week, this is the foundation. That's the foundation to build upon to have deeper relationships. Yeah. To be able to talk to one another and to have healthy relationships that mature and also to break bad dysfunctional habits yeah. and how we interact with one another. So this is very, this is very key for us and when you think about all the things we've studied so far in the Sermon on the Mount, we're, we're, we want to change, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. You want to be a better version of yourself that looks more like Jesus uh, today than it did yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we want to be. And But at, once you get through even two chapters of the Sermon on the Mount, it becomes quite overwhelming, doesn't it? Yeah. Many things. Many things to change to become more like Jesus, specifically in our relationships with one another. It can be quite overwhelming. I ended last week by saying this. Our best days as Christians are right in front of us. Amen. Our best days as Christians are right in front of us. But how? How? Let's go to Jesus for the answer. Matthew chapter 7. I need to be more. Yeah. Great times of growth are ahead of me. But how? Do you feel this way when we study the Sermon on the Mount? I mean, we, we look at the very beginning of it, and, and we're asked to wear these hiking boots of the Beatitudes. We're called to be light and salt to our friends, our family, our neighbors, to strangers. We're called to preach the gospel, not only with words, but our life as well. It's a high calling. We're not only supposed to obey all these commands, but we're supposed to obey them from the inside out. Our motivation has to be correct. Overwhelming, isn't it? We can't stay angry with one another. We're called to resolve matters quickly. When someone is unfair to us, when someone physically harms us, emotionally harms us, Jesus says, do not retaliate, yep. but in fact, overwhelm them with your love. Amen. Extraordinary love. We're to have eyes of purity. Purity of mind, purity of heart, wiping away lust and pornography, and seeing each other as sons and daughters of God. And as we discussed just last week, on top of all that, we're supposed to help each other with our sin. Without being mean-spirited and critical. Our best days are ahead of us. <laughs> we have a lot to change, but how? And, and I didn't even mention this, we're supposed to do all of this without worrying about it. <laughs> Because 
worry is ungodly. Our best days as Christians are right in front of us. But how? Matthew 7, verse 7. Jesus says, ask. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, that door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, thank you, Jesus, know how to give good gifts to your own children, how much more, there's that much more again, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Ask, seek. Knock. And again, this is in present imperative tense in the Greek. So it's just like verse 1 of chapter 7 when Jesus says, do not keep on criticizing other people. Here he gives us a contrasting command in that same tense. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. In other words, get after it in prayer. Go for it in prayer. My best days as a Christian are right in front of me. But how? Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. You say, well, I want to believe in God. I'm interested in, in really living as a Christian. I want to I make it to heaven. But how? Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. You know, people I love, they're, they're people I really love, and it's killing me. They're hard-hearted to God. I want them to change, but how? Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. It's the same. I, I, I want this lifestyle described in the Sermon on the Mount. I want to become a better, better parent. I want a better family. I want to get unstuck in my marriage, but how? I, I want to see more love. I want to see deeper relationships in this church, but how? Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. I want to help someone become a Christian. It's been a long time since I've done that, but how? I want to see the gospel spread to Aberdeen. Dundee, St. Andrews, the highlands, the islands, the borders. But how? Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. No shortcuts to the supernatural. It takes passionate and persistent prayer. It takes brash and shameless prayer. Prayer is the birthplace of miracles. That's where it starts. Prayer is the birthplace of miracles. Keep on asking, Jesus says, and it will be given to you. To ask. This is bringing a very real need to someone that you believe can meet that need. That's what you do when you ask. And commonly when you need to ask for someone, you're, you're asking someone who probably in some way is superior to you because they can provide this for you. So to keep on asking, that takes humility. It takes us back to ground zero in this sermon. Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's hard though, isn't it? Who here has a problem asking for help? Raise your hand. Okay, I guess it depends what it is, but give me some rapid fire answers here. What way are you most reluctant to ask for help? Just quick, Ben. I might look really stupid. Okay, you might look really stupid, okay. And in, in what ways as well? What ways would you be reluctant to ask? Something specific, yeah. Um, 
been in any kind of position of leadership, I've tried to take the burden on myself rather than asking for help. Yeah. Which isn't good. Simon? I think how you feel that I should actually know how to do this myself, but I don't need to. Exactly. Yes. Leslie, the mic. I think if you're snowed under at work or something like that, and you don't want people to think that you're incapable mm -hmm. of doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's pretty much identical to Leslie's. You know, if you're in business and then you ask people for help, then they're going to think less of you and yeah. give you less business. It puts you in an inferior position yeah. in that specific area. It's difficult. It's embarrassing. Yeah, you know, for me personally, I'm not a fix-it man. Like handyman. That's right. Like, it, it's embarrassing. I have to ask. So many times I have to ask other guys, well, what's that tool? And what tool do I need? And you should see me at the hardware store. I mean, I have to go in there so humble. It just tests my pride. So I have no, can I get that thingy? And what does that thingy do? And, you know, having to ask them, you know, and there's many women that are better at fixing things than me. I'm learning, I'm getting better over the years, but it's tough. Our pride kicks in. And we start shaming ourselves and we think, well, I should know how to do this. I should know how to fix this. I shouldn't need help with this. Or we lose hope. We self pity. <laughs> You know, this, this is never going to change for me. This is never going to change for us. You know, our weakness is no problem for God. Yeah. Our weakness is a problem for our pride. Yeah. So we have so many things that are so hard to ask for help about with God or with other people. Our children, money, purity, marriage, our career, our weight. Our struggle with belief. Any of these things are very embarrassing and humiliating mm -hmm. to ask someone else, including God, for help with. But Jesus says, keep on asking. Mm -hmm. But it will take humility. James 4, verse 2, the Holy Spirit tells us this. You do not have because you do not ask. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then Jesus says, keep on seeking. And you will find. Now to seek, this involves asking, but now it involves action. When you seek, you're expressing this desperate need in action. And what you're doing is you, you'll get up, you'll move around, and, and you'll look around for help. When you seek, effort is required. It takes effort. Now, I think about my smartphone, my iPhone. Okay, for me, it's an electronic wallet. It's my camera. It's my storage of video of my children and events that I've done. Photos are on there. Email. My residency card is attached to it. My credit card, and it's also a phone, by the way. Sometimes I use it for that. <laughs> and I'm just thinking here, I, I'm not really sure where it is. Mark it. Oh, no. Mark it. I'm supposed to have it. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. Everyone's uncomfortable. Has anyone seen my phone? Well, I was trying to tell you a second ago. Oh, uh, uh, yeah? At reception, uh, they said someone might have had, they've got a phone that someone might have lost from here, I don't know. Don't know if it's yours. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so if I'm, if I'm seeking... Alright, so it's at reception. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, so I just might as well just sit down and... <laughs> Maybe I'll just look for it next week. Because <laughs> Mike says Mike says it's in reception. So it could be at reception, but that's okay. I'll just I'll be here next week, guys. Actually I'll be out of town next week. I'll just give it two weeks. It won't be here next week. Is that seeking? No. <laughs> Alright. 
seeking is I, I start asking you questions. Has anyone seen my phone? Yeah. It's very valuable to me. It's important. Has anyone seen it? Okay. And then if I if I if I know where the last I, I usually sit over here, so I'm looking over here. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm almost trying to peel up the carpet. I'm so desperate. And then I'll go back and look at my pockets again. Did I leave it there? Is it on my head? You know, I, I don't know. Then I'll go over here. Is it in, is it in this bag? And then I, I'm just willing to just do anything to find it. I'm desperate. I'm desperate to find it. I'm going to just ask people. I'm going to move around. Yeah. I, I am humiliating myself in front of you because I want my phone. Yeah. Have you seen it, James? It's okay. <laughs> Do you mean this one here? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for helping me out. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a desperate, urgent search. That's what seeking is. It's as if your eternal life depended upon it. And we're just talking about a phone. Right? So, to translate this for us, what I was doing with my phone, this is me on the, on the floor looking to figure out, this is me seeking to figure out how to successfully remove specks from other people's eyes. How am I going to figure this out? i got to work to do this. This is me uh, learning to love my enemies. How am I going to do this? Do you know how to do this? You know, I'm, I'm moving around doing this. If, if I'm not sure I'm even a Christian yet, I want to believe. I, I think there's a heaven and a hell. I'm going to move around. I want to find, I want to find some answers for this. Yeah. I'm going to make the move. I love my children. So it's on me, not someone else to search. It's on me to look around for answers to help them to love Jesus. Where am I going to find that? Because I want my children to love Jesus. Yeah. That's seeking. Amen. That's what that is. Is that what it's looking like for you in your life? <laughs> the things you want to change, the things you want to see happen that are miraculous. <clears throat> That's where we want to be. Willing to look ridiculous. <laughs> Willing to do whatever it takes. That's seeking. Yeah. <clears throat> and Jesus promises, seek and you will find. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Now, one of my favorite TV shows from the 1990s, Seinfeld. Yeah. And I'll explain just a bit of the show. It's so complex, but it's really a show about nothing. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld, <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld's the main character, and he has this next door neighbor who's very slapstick and quirky and crazy. He's always up to something. But he has this neighbor that's right across the hall from his flat, and his name is Cosmo Kramer. So one of the things that Kramer is famous for in this TV show is he's famous for barging into Jerry's flat, and he does it every episode, sometimes multiple times in an episode, Kramer will just run into the flat, unannounced, and most of the time he does it without knocking. So I want to show you an example from just one season, one season of that TV show of Kramer entering into Jerry's flat. Now keep in mind as I show this how shameless and how free Kramer feels to enter into Jerry's world and to enter into Jerry's flat.
go. <laughs> Nine seasons of that TV show, nearly 400 entrances wow. into Jerry's flat and into <laughs> toilet stalls as well. But uh, keep in mind here, just all these hundreds of entrances. And I found out this week he only knocked in the first episode. Oh. And then on he just walked right in. So this is an example of what Jesus is talking about, of just coming on in and just keep on going for it. Just keep on knocking. No shame to enter. No shame that you could be an inconvenience to the homeowner. He barges into the room with any number of emotions. He could be wearing anything. Uh, any life situation he brings into that flat, he has the freedom to enter and just start talking as if they were already having the conversation before. And he just, a lot of times he just comes in and he just starts asking for things. And he does it, and that's one season, he does it over and over and over again. And it's become his second home. And see, that's what Jesus dares us to do with God. He knows we must do this with God. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Come into God's presence and make it your second home. Because, why? It's the birthplace of miracles. In verses 9 through 11, Jesus encourages us, and he lightens the mood with some humor there. And he's basically saying, if God is our Father, he will provide exactly what we need in the timing that we need it. But we do need to ask for it. We do need to seek it. We do need to knock down the doors of heaven and get God's attention with these things. Jesus jokes, you know, if, if a son asks for bread, you're not going to give him a piece of bread or a rock that looks like a piece of bread. And, so, and then he chews the rock and his teeth break and then the father just laughs at it. That's not what God's going to do. Or if the son is hungry and asks for a fish to eat, you know, the dad's not going to give him an eel that looks like a fish and then, and then you know, scares his son with this snake. And it's the same with our Father with the Sermon on the Mount. He's not giving us commands so he can sit back and go, <laughs> they're never going to be able to do that. He wants to help them with these things. He wants to help us. He gives us these perfect ways to live so we can experience a taste of heaven on earth. He knows what's best for us. We must Get after it in prayer. And the question I ask, are we praying kingdom prayers? What do you pray the most about? Reflect on these things. Think about your habits. Are we praying kingdom prayers? What do you pray the most about day after day, year after year? Do we pray more for physical needs than we do spiritual needs? Do we pray more about aches and pains and illnesses? Or do we pray more about being a man or woman to live the kingdom life? Do we pray more about our finances? Or do we pray more about just being poor in spirit? Do we pray more about being humble like a small child? Do we pray and, and, and complain more to God about unfair situations that we face? Or do we pray more about having a spirit of non-retaliation and extraordinary love? Because here at the end of this section, Jesus gives us a promise. We can never, ever ask for too much spiritually from the Father. Our Father will always answer our prayers for spiritual growth. That's a guarantee. That's the context of ask, seek, 
and not. If we want to live the life described in this sermon and make a true difference in the lives around us and have all heaven break loose in our lives, we have to ask, seek, and knock. That's the context of this prayer. Our Father will always answer prayers for spiritual growth. He guarantees it. And imagine if all of us as a church, what if we all started praying these kingdom prayers? What if we started praying these kingdom prayers with, with as much intensity as we do about our physical needs or the need of the moment? This church would explode. We would experience the power of God. If we get after it with these kingdom prayers, our relationships will dramatically change. We'll have the power to do it because it comes from above. Our relationships will change. Our marriages will change. Our families will change. We start becoming, uh, on the inside, what we're striving to do on the outside. It becomes a part of us. All heaven will break loose in our homes, in this church, in this city. Our best days as Christians are right in front of us. But here's how we do it. We keep on asking. We keep on seeking. And we keep on knocking. Amen. At this time, we're going to remember Jesus, His death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, he led the way for us. He's out in front of us. He's who we want to be. We want to make just a fraction of the impact He did. Let's remember Him at this time. Let's pray as we prepare to think on Jesus, our hero. Father in heaven, we love you so much. We thank you that we can remember Jesus at this time. He is inspiring. His words have authority. His teachings work. They change the world. They change relationships. They touch our hearts. Father, we, we love Jesus. We're so thankful for the impact he made in less than 33 years. Amazing. And we're still talking about it. Not only that, God, he died for us, was buried, and he rose from the dead. God, I pray that we remember him now. We give honor to him. We glorify your name through him. And then we're just excited that we get to wear the name Christian. That we want to become Christians if that's where we're at today. Thank you so much for Jesus. Help us to be inspired by him. God, we, we want to come to you. We want to knock down your door. Uh, we can't wait to see you one day in heaven. But uh, we pray that you unleash some of that heaven on earth here in Edinburgh for us. Through the teachings of Jesus, through our lives. We love you, we praise you, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.